So when it comes to the Chicana movement, they they had limited options. So hopefully you you did the reading for the uh, for the week, and you noticed that um, they weren't happy in the Chicano movement. They many of them didn't want to go into the Chicano uh, sorry the Anglo feminist movement. So what options did they have? Well, uh, by the late sixties, you do begin to see Chicana organizations such as Las Hijas de Guatemoc. This was a university-based organization that focused on women issues. Uh, it was based on, on um, at um, Long Beach State in California. So this was one of the first Chicana organizations to emerge. However, the most kind of important one, because this one wasn't at, at a university where only college students would attend, but this one was more community-based, was Comisión Femenil Mexicana Nacional, which is the organization that I wrote my, my dissertation on. They did a lot of things, and I'm not going to bore you with them. Um, two kind of th key things that they, they formed was the um, uh, Chicano Service Action Center, which focused on uh, getting women jobs, uh, particularly good paying jobs. And then the second one was uh, a program called Centro de Niños, where um, these women uh, who sought their help could get affordable child care. So since they were focusing on single mothers, you know, many of these women didn't have a place to leave their kids. So they created a child care program that focused on their culture to help them. And it was one of the most successful programs from this organization. They did a few other things too, but um, again, I'm going to bore you with it. <clears throat> Another, uh, so Comisión Femenil Mexicana Nacional, or CFMN as it was known, uh, was first established in 1970. That's when it becomes an official organization. Two kind of key things that I will address is some of the issues that they were involved in. <clears throat> One of them was this famous case called the Madrigal versus Killigan case. In the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, Latina women, you know, didn't have access to affordable health care. So they would go to these doctors when they were pregnant. And what would happen is that when they were giving birth at the uh, USC Medical Center in Los Angeles that um, these doctors would actually tie their tubes without their knowledge. And, and it's, it's a very famous case that Comisión Femenil and other organizations participated in. But the case itself kind of signified and, and it almost uh, reminded people of, of sterilization cases of the 1900s when they try to eliminate certain parts of the population, people who were um, what do you call it, like um, mentally incapable or, or, you know, just maybe even other particular groups of the community. And here it felt like they were doing it to uh, specifically Latina women. Uh, they, they were also doing these type of things to um, Native American women and African American women too, around the same time. <clears throat> so this, is a, this was an isolated experience. And a lot of the, kind of like the arguments as to why it was okay to tie their tubes, and it never was, but right, these doctors that did it said it was okay because these women would go on welfare as though it was going to cost the state more money, right? So they were doing like this kind of public serv service. And they, it, it was a very kind of nasty situation because um, a lot of times these doctors were kind of pushed towards sterilization, uh, partly because they needed the training in it right? Because as a doctor, you need to perform them so you get good at them. But it was noted that typically Latina women were the ones that were pushed towards sterilization. Sometimes they were asked them to, to be sterilized in the middle of a pregnancy, right? They're, they were about to give birth and they would have them sign some papers. And, you know, if you're trying to pop out this baby, it's, it's going to be kind of painful. And they would say, well, we, we won't per, uh, proceed unless you sign these papers. So these women sign whatever was put in front of them. Other times they would get translators that were not official medical translators, such as, you know, people who were custodians and say, can you translate for me? And the doctors would give them this information and they would translate it to some of, you know, some of these women. And they, you know, these translators don't have that knowledge of, uh, that deep medical knowledge. So they, you know, they would ask questions and they wouldn't be able to answer it or answer it incorrectly, such as, you know, is this procedure reversible? And they would say, oh yeah, it's reversible, even though it's not. So uh, this was a very kind of problematic case in, in many ways. There's actually a documentary, and I'll, I'll post a, um, a clip so you can just look at the trailer. The documentary's out there, though. Um, so the case went to court, and um, like I said, many organizations were involved. Comisión Feminil was one of them. 
and they ended up losing the case. But what came out of it um, were some important reforms. The judge said, I think something like there was a miscommunication or you know, something like that. And uh, kind of let these doctors off the hook, or at least this medical center off the hook. But some important reforms emerged. Number one is that you don't ask a woman while she's about to deliver a baby if she wants to, her tubes tied, right? It's just, you know, I think they would sign anything to get this baby out of their body. Number two, you needed a 30 day cooling off period before the procedure. Therefore, if you had a change of mind, uh, you know, you, you had those 30 days to change your mind. Number three, um, that you needed a bilingual uh, consent form. So these uh, women could take the form, read it, um, you know, talk about it with, um, talk about the, you know, use the forms and talk about it with other people to see if this was a good idea, a good procedure for them. But ultimately it's their choice, right? Not that it's forced upon them. And then lastly, they needed to follow federal policies. So it, it almost felt like the state was going rogue here and doing things that they wanted to do based off their kind of political ideals rather than following the policies that were already in place by the federal government. Um, again, understand that even though I'm just lecturing this stuff and it's very kind of abstract, um, hopefully you, you, you'll watch that quick trailer. It's like a two minute trailer of what these women went through because it was quite horrific, the experience that, that they went through. <clears throat> Uh, another issue that Comisión Femenil, along with a lot of other women, kind of dealt with was this issue of abortion. Uh, in the 1970s, it's, you begin to see the um, implementation of legal abortion because prior to that, it was illegal and people were getting abortion anyways through um, what they would call back alley clinics. You know, they, they were not sanitary, they were legal. Um, some women bled to death. So in 1972, um, uh, with Roe v. Wade, um, they, they passed the, the legalization of, of abortions. And for a short period of time, it, it was covered, you know, by, by state funds. So you have this kind of conservative movement to stop it. So regardless of how you feel about abortion, uh, for many Latina and Chicana women, they feel it's their body and they have their choice if they want to get one. And Comisión Femenil supported that idea, right? That if it's your choice, then you should not only have the right to get an abortion, but also have the state pay for it. And, and this is a reason why. Uh, many of them, Comisión in particular, uh, approached it from, uh, again, that kind of communist influence that they that their background, background had. So many Latina women were single-headed households, which meant there was no you know, other partner to help them provide for their family. So sometimes an abortion made sense, right? Uh, so Roe v. Wade made it legal, but quite quickly, there was something called the Hyde Amendment that made it illegal for the state to pay for it. So abortions were legal, it's just that the state would not pay for it. And to this day, it's, it's still in place that the state will not pay for your abortion. Well, what Comisión Femenil um, did was basically argue that the state should be able to fund this because number one, it's just, Economically, it's just better for the state, right? When you're talking about healthcare costs and welfare costs, uh, in the 1970s, an abortion cost about $150, which might sound a lot, a lot of money, uh, maybe even today for some of you, but $150 compared to the cost of taking care of a kid is much cheaper. So to give child, um, to give birth at a hospital costs 13, almost, you know, $1,300 uh, plus $1,300. An abortion was $150, so uh, organizations such as Comision would argue it's actually quite cheaper to have a woman get an abortion than have this, you know, taxpayer pay for a birth. Uh, keep that in mind too, because many of these conservatives argued, well, we don't want these ladies on welfare. Well, some of these women might have gone on welfare, and it's going to cost the state even more. So, um, for organizations such as Comision, um, it, it made sense for the state to fund something like this because in the long run, this is actually going to save you, you know, tax, joke taxpayer, <clears throat> a lot less money, quite significantly a lot less to, for a woman to go ahead and get an abortion outside of the, the you know, the politics. <clears throat> so they kind of critique this Hyde Amendment because it's really just a conservative group uh, that's a minority that was kind of passing law for the majority. 
And um, that, you know, like I said, it's still illegal for the state to pay for an abortion. And um, it actually did get through where the will of a minority um, supersedes the, the will of the majority. So <clears throat> the Hyde Amendment did pass, but it does kind of showcase, this example does kind of showcase how Comisión Femenil looked at this stuff um, from a very logical sense, right? Uh, again, very economic sense in this example where it's just cheaper all around for the state to, to pay for an abortion. <clears throat> and then in the 1970s, uh, and I'm not sure even today if there's a consensus on this, but in the 1970s, you know, no, nobody had a, an idea as to when life begins. And I know today is still quite debated. Is it, is it when you, you know, when the baby comes out? Is it when you hear a heartbeat? When, when does life begin? And these are our, you know, uh, all, all things that are still being debated um, with the issue of abortion. So Comisión Femini was saw it very problematic, but the Hyde Amendment, again, was passing judgment on when life begins and that um, you know, women cannot get an abortion. So what are, what do we learn? Number one, we learned that um, Chicana feminism is definitely rooted on you know this kind of left, progressive leaning um, ideology, right? Many of the members, or not many, but some of the members of Comisión Feminine were part of the Communist Party, particularly the founding me member Francisca Flores. However, other Chicana feminists came from that. Communist Party influence, such as Emma Tena Yuka and, and Luisa Moreno. So, uh, so the Chicana feminist movement doesn't come out of nowhere. It's heavily influenced by the generation that preceded them. Number two, we begin to see how Chicanas challenge stereotypes that put Chicanas on the pedestal. And, and you saw that in one of the, the readings, right? A lot of times Chicana men put women in pedestals. And yet we find that there are many Chicanas that are independent there. Uh, not only during this time, but historically, such as people like Las Tullas and La Malinche. And then lastly, Chicanas address this concept of triple oppression. Um, <clears throat> so even though there are white feminists out there, not all feminism is equal, right? Every group looks at these different issues from a different lens. So Chicana feminists, um, they looked at it, along with other women of color, they looked at it from this, you know, triple oppression of race, class, and gender, which is something that white feminists could not understand because they, they never experienced some of the things that these women experienced. Yes, they, they had a common the idea that they're women, but white women don't go through racism, and white women, at least the feminists during this period, most of them were middle class, so they didn't quite comprehend some of the issues that Chicanas went through. So we'll stop it right there. And this concludes the lecture on feminism.